Hey, everybody. Welcome to Blue Collar Sports Talk. This is Daryl. This is where I tell you about what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to go over some Husker sports. I'll discuss some NCAA football. I might even talk about some other stuff. But I want everyone to take a little bit of time and be thankful for what you have. I mean, that's what this time of year is for, right? Thanksgiving. Anyway, here's the show. Enjoy. Let's get excited, shall we? This Friday, the Huskers are going to take on Wisconsin in the rematch everybody wants to see. 3 p.m. on Big Ten if you want to watch it. Number five, Wisconsin. Number five, Wisconsin has lost a couple recently. They lost on the road to Penn State and Purdue. Now the Badgers are looking to bounce back and avenge that October loss they suffered in Lincoln. Recently, the Big Ten offices have named our Husker libero Lexi Rodriguez to Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. The Huskers' defensive skills on the volleyball court are amazing. We have a nation-leading defense, and we're hoping to limit the Badgers. As of right now, the Huskers are leading the nation in opponent hitting percentage. The opponent hitting percentage is at .131. Amazing. Great job, Lady Huskers. The previous match between the Badgers and the Huskers went five sets in this upcoming match on Friday versus now number five Wisconsin will surely be just as exciting. After Friday's match, the Huskers will have their final regular season matchup on the road at Minnesota the following day. And Saturday's match against Minnesota will be on Big Ten Network. That is an 8 p.m. match. So kind of a tough way to finish out the regular season with two on-the-road matches battling a very, 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 I'll say it again, very tough Badgers team and then going to Minnesota the following day. So Huskers, wish you all the best and let's get it done right before the big tournament starts. Another team, another Husker squad that's been having some great success as of late, the Husker Ladies Soccer Team. The fifth-seeded Nebraska soccer team will face three-time national champ and the number two seed Stanford on Friday. This match will be carried on ESPN Plus at 4 p.m. This marks the third time, the third time the Husker women's soccer team has reached the Elite Eight. They're battling a very tough Cardinals team who are 18-0 with four ties on the year. Wish the Lady Huskers soccer team all the best, and we hope they can get it done. Another Husker women's team, the basketball team, are on the road in sunny St. Petersburg, Florida for the St. Pete Showcase. Now, their next two games are tomorrow, Thursday, and then Saturday against Lamar and then TCU on Saturday, their next home game. The next home game for the ladies Huskers, Wednesday, November 29th versus Florida Atlantic at 7 p.m. That should be a great three-game series here if you're a Lady Huskers basketball fan. Moving over to the Husker men. Wow, what a roll. To start the season, the Husker men are undefeated. And we next have Duquesne. That's tonight, Wednesday, November 22nd. This will be on Big Ten, 7 p.m. tonight. The Huskers will also be at home for the next two games. Sunday, they take on Cal State Fullerton. This will be on Big Ten Plus. And then next Sunday, December 3rd, in-state rival number eight Creighton will come to Pinnacle Bank Arena December the 3rd. This basketball battle can be seen on FS1 with tip-off at 3 p.m. So, um, I'm now going to get somber because I'm now going to talk about the Husker football team. Friday will be the Husker football team's chance to secure a win to be bowl eligible. We haven't seen a bowl in a lot of years. Too many years, in my opinion. 
We host number 17 Iowa for an 11 a.m. game in Memorial Stadium, and I hope our teams get a much-needed win at home. I do. I hope the Huskers get it done. I wanted to take a look at the Husker program here. I wanted to look back and see if I can try to understand how we got to this drought of bowl of seasons. So bear with me here. We used to have consistency in the program and the athletic director's office, both. We had consistency in the athletic director's office and we had consistency as head coaches for the Husker football team. Think about this. Bob Devaney saw to that as athletic director from 67 to 1992. Then the reins were turned over to Bill Byrne as athletic director. He helped coach Tom Osborne pass the torch to then head coach Frank Solich. Now, this is where things started to decline, in my opinion. 2003, Steve Peterson became athletic director, and in 2003, he gave Solich his walking papers, where Solich marched directly to Ohio University and posted 115 victories. Those 115 victories made him the winning, made him the winningest, the winningest, I'll say it again, the winningest head coach in Mac history. You know, it, it makes me wonder what could have been if Peterson would have been shown the door in, instead of Solich. So then Peterson named Bill Callahan head coach. Callahan lasted till 2007. Sure. Now, if you want to get technical, Bo Pelini was interim head coach briefly for a bowl game after Frank Solich was dismissed. Now, notably, Peterson only lasted till 2007 as athletic director. And former head coach Tom Osborne is named athletic director. Now, 2008, Bo Pelini is head coach. He, uh, let's see. What was that? 2008 to 2014, Polini lasted. And now Sean Eichhorst is named athletic director in 2013. All right. Sean Eichhorst then fires Bo in 2014. Barney Cotton is tasked with being interim head coach for a game. The all-knowing athletic director Eichhorst hires a friendly grandpa figure in Mike Riley. Yeah, Mike Riley might have been a great recruiter, but he was not. He was not the best coach when it comes to winning games. Mike Riley posted a 19 and 19 record from 2015 to 2017. And unless you have amnesia or purposefully hit yourself in the head with a rock numerous times to forget those moments we had under head coach Scott Frost from 2018 to 2022. Scott was hired by another athletic director we had, Bill Moose. Yes, yet another athletic director. So for those of you bad at numbers like me, uh, give me a second here. Let me count on the fingers. Here. Uh, okay, that makes six. Six athletic directors since 1990. And after Moose was relieved of his duties in 2021, the Huskers are on their seventh athletic director and ninth coach. If you count a couple interim tags held by Barney Cotton and Mickey Joseph. Um, yeah, Trev Alberts is our seventh athletic director. And yes, Matt Rule is our ninth coach. But it's not all bad, okay? Folks, it's not all bad. You just have to look at the dysfunction of Texas A&M and their record buyout of over $70 million when they fired Jimbo Fisher, to realize we, we haven't had it all bad, all right? So in terms of money spent on fired coaches, that paltry $20 million or plus or minus, whatever it is exactly, I'm not sure, I couldn't count that high, that the Huskers have spent on telling people you can't coach here no more, really isn't that bad. Yeah, uh, where was I going with all this? Uh, truly, let's see, I forget. Uh, oh, yeah. With all the turnover in the athletic director's office, how do you expect a program to operate with consistency? 
when Osborne and Devaney, and even Solich for that matter for a while, when they all coached there, they had consistency in their program. My hope, my hope is that apart from some crazy scenario that forces Trev to vacate the athletic director's office, and some weirder scenario that forces Matt Rule to go into hiding, My hope is that both stay in their respective roles for a long, long time, and the Husker football team is allowed to become a mighty and feared program once again for any opponent that comes to Memorial Stadium. So in summary, go Huskers versus Iowa on Friday. This could be your next step to becoming a feared national powerhouse once again. I feel we're close. The Huskers' defense is mighty. And the mighty Husker turnover machine needs to be changed into the Husker scoring machine. And I feel that Matt Rule is on the right track to get the Huskers there. So please, Matt Rule, continue on. Get us back to dominance. Staying in the realm of NCAA football, the uh, the upcoming rivalry week, this, this could and should be epic. Starting at 11 a.m., the Ohio State Buckeyes go on the road to battle the naughty, naughty cheaters of Ann Arbor. Yeah, they're also known as the Michigan Wolverines. The Michigan sidelines will be without Harbaugh, the naughty, naughty cheater, and their recently fired naughty, naughty cheater linebacker coach Chris Partridge. Rumors and speculation have stated that Partridge helped impede the investigations of the sign stealing by former Michigan staffer Connor Stallion, and that's why Michigan really kind of just bowed its naughty, naughty head away from any court proceedings that they thought that they had a chance to win. I digress. One question. What happens in the college football playoff top four after one of these teams lose? Because that's really, that's all important. Who cares about Michigan cheating? Really, who cares? Ohio State loses, what happens? Michigan loses, what happens to the top four order? That's, That's the most important thing there. Now, the other two matchups going on in college football this week that college football playoff fans will and should take notice to are the Washington Huskies matchup with the Washington State Cougars, a Pac-12 in-state rivalry game. And after the new conference lineups in 2024, these teams forming new rivalries next year? I I think they're going to have to, right? Anyway, Washington was placed in the fourth spot of the college football playoff rankings this week, which meant that the Florida State team was knocked down and pegged to fifth all thanks to strength of schedule. Florida State also has an in-state rivalry game. They go to Gainesville to battle the Gators in the swamp. Next week, for the conference championship games, the SEC game is already set with Georgia battling Alabama. Washington has to wait a week to see who they battle in the Pac-12 championship game. And Louisville will battle Florida State in the ACC championship game. Add all that up, subtract 7, multiply by 43, and divide by the integer, and then cross-reference that with the predictive revenue from the traveling teams and add up the strength of schedule put together by margin counting, and you then get the top four teams battling in the college football playoffs. Side note, next year, I can't wait for the the 12-team playoffs. I can't. I can't wait for the 12-team playoffs next year. All right, moving on. And in honor of Thanksgiving, I want to offer a few turkey awards. These aren't prestigious. These are kind of like awards, all right? The first is for a team formerly known as the Redskins. The Washington Commanders are a turkey. They are a mess. And I hope they don't doom Eric Bieniemy's career anymore. Yeah, I do think that they should fire Ron Riviera and make Bieniemy the head coach. 
but they are a horrible organization at the moment. And if all the rumors are true, there could be multiple head coaching spots across the NFL next year. And I hope the enemy could secure one of those. But, but if he is tapped to lead the commanders, I wish him all the luck because I believe he is a talented coach. The next Turkey award goes to the offensive line of the New York Jets. You might even be worse than a turkey. All right, I'm going to pick some animal that is extinct for this award. Let's pick the dodo bird. A flightless bird is my choice for the Jets award. They are as a flightless team as a dodo, and they now have recently benched Zach Wilson. Who knows how long Sala will be a coach there, all right? They're just very, very bad at the moment. I'm going to move over to the NBA for the next award. The Detroit Pistons get an early season Turkey award. This team has managed to win two games this year. They started the season with 12 straight losses. Truly deserving of a Turkey award. Now, if you're an NFL fan above the age of 30, you might or probably remember John Madden's broadcast on Thanksgivings where he would add more turkey legs to the Thanksgiving turkey and he would give the legs out as an award. Think all the way back to the first ever turkey leg recipient. Know who that is? Eagles linebacker Reggie White. After helping his Eagles shut out a Troy Aikman-led Dallas Cowboys team to the tune of 27 to nothing, John Madden handed out his first ever turkey leg as an award. Now, this year on Thanksgiving, the NFL has scheduled some fun games. Sure, we don't have John Madden doing his fun turkey leg thing, but the first fun game, you'll see the Packers at the Lions. This is an 11:30 matchup on Fox. The Lions get a turkey leg for being 8-2. and two. This is the first time since 1962 that the Lions have been 8-2. and two. Now, the Lions are favored by 7.5, and, and this should be a fun game if you're a Lions fan. And unfortunately, it might be a rough game if you're a Packers fan. The 3 p.m. game is with a team I called a turkey earlier. Yes, the hapless commanders go to Dallas to get a lesson in how to play football. This mess of a game can be seen on CBS at 3.30 p.m. Last I looked, Dallas is favored by 500. I'm kidding. Plus or minus 487 and a half. Yeah, Dallas is favored, I think, by 12 and a half. That's what I'm trying to say. The late Thanksgiving game has a bird battling a 49er. Yes. The bird is the Seahawk. The Seahawks take on San Francisco at home. The 49ers have won their last two. And that was after a rough three-game losing streak. The Seahawks are looking for a win after losing a close one to the Rams on the road last week. I think this should be a fun game to watch. So we'll see who comes out on top. The Seahawks at home or the 49ers on the road. Although it isn't on Turkey Day, another team I called a turkey. Yes, I'm looking at you right now, Jets. All right, actually, I called them the Dodo Birds. Well, the Flightless Jets, with their former third-string QB, now elevated to QB1, will battle the Dolphins. Although this will be a home game for the Jets, I don't foresee the home crowd cheering happily for the Jets. I see Miami flying into MetLife Stadium, and I see them taking any life left in the Jets organization and stomping it into a mangled mess. Miami comes out with a win. If not, somehow everybody on the Miami Dolphins team came down with food poisoning. And the Jets luckily won by one point. Otherwise, Miami wins easily. Now, one last game I want to mention. This is in the NBA world. And this is after all the James Harden news. Seemingly year after every other year, James Harden has demanded a trade. Now, James Harden and his Clippers take on the Mavericks Saturday. That Saturday game is on NBA TV at 930. 
the, the Clippers have what I call a tune-up game against the 3-11 and Spurs tonight, Wednesday, before meeting the Mavericks. And to me, it looks like every each and every game, the Mavericks superstar tandem of Kyrie and Luka, they keep getting better and better. And it also appears the Clippers and their supposed ultra-super team filled with future Hall of Famers might also be getting better and better. Coach Tyron Liu of the Clippers has his work cut out for him, getting the best out of Harden, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, Russell Westbrook, and Zubox. Now, I'm guessing this Mavs and Clippers game will be a battle that you don't want to miss. But I think the Mavs are outmatched here. The bench for the Clippers is deep, deep, deep. With players like Daniel Tice, Norman Powell, Russell Westbrook, and P.J. Tucker. And yes, I said Westbrook off the bench. And no, you haven't heard any news reports about Westbrook coming off the bench. I feel that Tyron Liu is getting this team to gel, and no matter what role he's asking them to do, they are doing it for now. Well, that is all the nonsensical ramblings on sports that I have for the moment. I hope everyone has a great Thanksgiving and enjoys a lot of helpings of great sports moments. And don't forget to be thankful for the Husker women's volleyball team. Go watch some sports.